And I want you guys to picture this scenario. We have a primordial earth. There's so far nothing on the land. There's fish in the sea. We've developed fish at this point. And at some point, 420 million years, I'm going to throw this number out here right now. I'll unpack it in a little bit. We get the first plants that appear on land. So these are the first multicellular organisms that start to appear outside of the oceans, that start to colonize the real face of the earth as we know it. <coughs> Fast forward about 50 million years, and you get your first animals on land. These are the amphibians, things like frogs, toads, that sort of thing, that can live on both land and water. They come to be able to take advantage of this food that's offered on the land by the plants that have come through and colonized it. It's not until 230 million years ago, about halfway between the plants first arriving on land and present day, that dinosaurs, as we really know them, came to exist. And these dinosaurs ruled the Earth for a while, until at some point about 65 million years ago, they suddenly vanish. And somewhere in the middle here, we have the Ice Age, which actually occurs a lot sooner than you guys might think. So the Ice Age occurs only two million years ago, the, a relative geologic blink of an eye. And then we have the first modern humans. And then as humans, we go on and develop civilization and build things like the pyramids. Now, to try to wrap your mind around these sorts of time scales, picture this. We're standing here right now with all of our fancy technology, our smartphones, internet connections, hot water in our houses, that sort of thing. Imagine a time before all that when we had just telegraphs. Imagine a time before that when we had the American Revolution. Before that when we had Columbus discovering America, the Roman Empire. All of these things happened in this first step right here that is such a small step that it can't even be displayed on this scale. All this happens in 4,000 years during modern human civilization. You take those 4,000 years of history and you multiply it by a factor of 25. That's the time difference between civilization and the first emergence of humans as we know them. During this time, during these 100,000 years, that's when we do things like discover how to work with tools. We discover fire, we discover agriculture, we invent language. Take all this human existence, this 100,000 years, multiply it by a factor of 20, and you get the distance between now and the last ice age, two million years ago. This is the time of woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, all those sorts of things. You take all of that distance and you multiply it by a factor of 30, that's the difference between present day and the time that the dinosaurs disappeared. And if you take that time and you multiply it by four, that's about how long the dinosaurs were ruling the face of the Earth. So imagine for a moment, if you will, all the things that have happened in our society, all the famines and droughts, all the hurricanes and earthquakes, all the disasters that might have befallen our one species over the course of 100,000 or even just 4,000 years. And then imagine all that multiplied over the entire existence of the dinosaurs from 230 million years ago to 65 million years. And you'll quickly realize that the dinosaurs weathered a lot of catastrophes during their time on Earth until whatever it was that happened here that took them all out. So the big million dollar question is, what exactly happened? Now, the view that tends to be shown a lot in the media that you see in movies and the internet and that sort of thing is that a huge asteroid came and crashed into the Earth one day and wiped out all the dinosaurs somehow. And this is true to some extent, but it doesn't quite tell the full story. And so I'm going to show you guys a little bit of data here. And this is a graph. On the horizontal or x-axis, this is the same arrow of time that I started you guys off with, starting off with present day on the far right, moving back in time to about 542 million years ago. Remember, about here is when the first plants appeared on the land outside of the oceans. On the vertical or y-axis, you can think of this as the number of different species that are on the Earth. And I want you guys to just pay attention to the green bars here. Ignore the gray lines here. These, this green area right here shows how many different species were on the Earth at a given point in time. And what you'll notice is that you, as you move from left to right, as you move forward in time, you get more and more species diversity. And this makes sense, because if you think about it, around here, the first plants appeared on the land surface, and they started to diversify from mosses into ferns and into trees and that sort of thing. And as you move further and further on, you develop things like amphibians, and then reptiles, and then birds, mammals, all the wonderful animal species that we see today. 
But the graph isn't always going completely up. There's these periodic dips in the graph. And five of them are significant. We call them the major mass extinction events. And there's also a couple of other smaller dips in the graph, which we call the minor mass extinction events. And I use minor as a relative term here. If you were living during them, it would have been pretty gosh darn awful. Um, but one thing I want to point out to you guys is it's not the first time, the dinosaurs going out wasn't the first time there was a major mass extinction event. In fact, that mass extinction event happened right here. And that's the only one for which we really think there was a meteor involved. For all of these other four mass extinction events, three of them were no longer seriously entertaining the idea that a meteor might have been a major contributor in there. And then for another one of them, maybe a meteor was involved, maybe not, but we don't think it was the primary contributor towards the mass extinction that happened then. And so you look at this and you very quickly realize, well, meteors can't explain all these mass extinction events. Something else had to have done them, and what might have that been? So I'm going to start you guys off with the outline of my talk. We're going to start by talking about supervolcanoes. These are actually the things that we think caused all of those other mass extinction events and may have also contributed to the dinosaur's demise. From there, we'll go into the evidence that we have that it might have actually been a meteor, because with all the evidence so, so strongly supporting supervolcanoes, we really need some solid conclusive evidence that there was a meteor before we can even start to entertain that hypothesis. We'll then go into what exactly that meteor would have done. How does a meteor go about and kill off all the dinosaurs? And then we'll finish with, could this happen again, and what can we do about that? So to start off on supervolcanoes, how exactly they would have killed off life multiple times on Earth. In order to understand how extinction events in general happen, you first need to understand the concept of food chains. These are at the core of every ecosystem on Earth, and it all starts with these organisms that we call primary producers. In most environments, you can think of them as basically plants. There are things that take sunlight and convert it into food for themselves and for other animals. These primary producers, or plants, are eaten by plant-eating animals, which we call herbivores, which means plant eaters. And these herbivores, in turn, serve as food for meat-eating animals, which we call carnivores, meat eaters. The carnivores are, in turn, eaten by higher and higher, bigger carnivores, bigger predators, all the way up until you reach what's known as the apex predator. This is the top eater in the system that eats other animals, but is itself not eaten by anything else in the ecosystem. Now, all ecosystems have one key vulnerability, and that's at the very base of the food chain, these primary producers. If something ever happens to block the sunlight, to prevent them from being able to get access to the food that they need, well, the plants die off because they don't have food anymore. They starve. And if the plants die off, well, all of a sudden, the plant eaters, they don't have anything to eat. And so they'll die off. And if the plant eaters die off, the meat eaters that rely on them, they'll go away. And it just goes on further and further up the food chain until you have a complete collapse of the ecosystem and you have multiple extinction events. So how do volcanoes enact this sort of thing? Because we have volcanoes erupting all the time right now, but we don't have any sort of major catastrophes happening to the ecosystem. To understand how that happens, we need to go over this concept of a volcanic winter. And at first, that term might seem a little bit strange to you, because you hear volcano and you think, OK, hot lava gushing thing. What does that have anything to do with winter? Well, volcanoes, we know them for their flashy lava aspects. But it turns out that the lava, the eruption itself, doesn't actually kill a whole lot of things, because most animals can sense the tremors in the earth long before the volcano erupts. And they'll have ample time to run away before the lava starts spewing out. And even when you have a lot of volcanoes going off at the same time, they're not covering the entire surface of the Earth in lava. Most of the Earth is still green and grassy and full of rich, plentiful food. And this lava will eventually harden into rock, which will become a productive, fertile region again for plants to grow back. The bigger danger, actually, comes from the ash that's released by the volcanic eruption. This ash will go up into the atmosphere. It remains suspended there for years on end. And if you have a large enough volcanic eruption, or if you have enough volcanoes going off in a short time period, this ash can stay in the air and block out sunlight, prevent it from reaching the Earth. Now, some of it is still going to go through, because the ash isn't going to completely envelop the Earth in darkness, but it's going to be much dimmer. Less sunlight is going to get through. And remember, if there's not enough sunlight around, then the plants die off. And if the plants die off, then all the animals have no food to eat, and so they'll die off. 
And we actually have evidence that this is a real thing that happens. Some of the adults in the audience might remember a volcano known as Mount Pinatubo. This is a volcano in the Philippines that erupted back in 1991. Here's a picture of it, actually, just a couple of minutes after that eruption. And you can see mountains here in the background. And you can see this huge ash cloud in comparison to it. And this ash cloud rose up and spread all over the Earth. And there were actually scientists who were measuring sunlight that was coming into the Earth at various locations. And this is some of their data. So again, on the horizontal x-axis, we have time, just on a much shorter time scale here. Here's 1996, here's 1958. This is only covering 50 years or so. On the vertical y-axis, we have how much sunlight was coming into the Earth. And you can see that for most years, there's a fairly steady amount of sunlight coming in, except for these two gigantic dips right here and right here. And these dips correspond to two very specific volcanic eruptions. The one on the right was Pinatubo, which I just showed you a picture of. And the one on the left is a volcano in Mexico known as El Chicón. And what you'll notice from these is that just a single volcanic eruption was enough to block out either one-fifth or one-quarter of sunlight coming into the Earth. And this dust lingered around for a long time. You'll notice that sunlight, sunlight levels don't return to normal for about two to three years after the eruption. And so you can very ima easily imagine a scenario in which if there's enough volcanoes going off in a short time span, they'll keep blocking out the sunlight, and it'll reduce the amount of food available for everything to eat. We actually have evidence for this in the form of multiple rock samples taken over the Earth, and so we have evidence that volcanoes were going off at the time of each of the major mass extinction events. So with that in mind, why do we even think a meteor was involved in the final extinction event of the dinosaurs? The story actually starts with these two fellows, Walter and Luis Alvarez. This was a father-son scientist team. Walter Alvarez, on the right, was a geologist. He's currently at UC Berkeley. And Luis Alvarez, his father, was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And Walter was going around collecting rock samples when he noticed something. So he called up his father and said, OK, Dad, so we got this thing that we noticed, and I want to hear your take on it. No matter where we go in the world, if we dig down far enough, if we dig until the rock is about 65 million years old, about the time the dinosaurs died out, we always see this white stripe right here. It's a layer of clay. We don't really know what to make of it. But we know that it's, it happened around the same time the dinosaurs died out. And we know that this rock that was above it, we call the rock from the Paleogene era, this is rock that was after all the dinosaurs went away. And the rock that was below it was from the Cretaceous period, the last time during which the dinosaurs existed. We call this clay layer here the KT boundary. And we have a feeling that might be important to understanding what might have happened, but we don't quite know what to make of it. So can we maybe take some samples for you, take some samples from before the dinosaurs died out, after, and right when the dinosaurs died out? Can we send them to your laboratory and have you analyze them on your big fancy science instruments? I'm sure that's exactly how the conversation went word for word. And so this guy said, OK, sure, sure, send, send me the samples. I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. And a couple of weeks later, he called up his dad and said, oh, hey, so I have some data for you from the samples you sent me. So we ran them through the instruments, and we were able to find a couple of things. So here's a mineral called nickel, and this is how much nickel was in your samples. On the left is your sample from while the dinosaurs were still alive. On the right is a sample from after the dinosaurs were gone. And then in the middle here is that sample from that white layer, just at the point where the dinosaurs died out. And OK, there's a lot more nickel at the time the dinosaurs died out. We don't really know what to make of it, but here's a clue for you. See what you can do with it. All right, OK, thanks, Dad. Do you have anything else for me? Yeah, we ran a couple of other things. Um, here's zinc, and here's cobalt. And you see kind of the same general trend right here. Oh, but actually, here's one thing, uh, iridium. There's no iridium before or after the dinosaurs died out, but there's a huge amount of it right at that boundary layer. And this is actually important, because there's a very good reason why there's no iridium before or after the dinosaurs died out. So to take you back even further than that first time era I showed you, back when the Earth was still in its early stages of formation, it wasn't always this nice, rocky planetary surface that we're standing on right now. It used to be, for lack of a better term, a gigantic molten ball of lava. And it was during this, during this time Everything was in upheaval. Elements were circling up, circling down, because everything was still fluid. Everything was still molten liquid. And during this time, all of the iridium actually sank into the Earth's core. 
And so none of it today is left on the surface of the Earth. It's far out of the reach for any volcanoes to be able to erupt it back on the surface of the Earth. And so any iridium that we find right here, just walking around, can only come from one place, and that's space. And so this was really the seed for people, being, for people really starting to think that maybe a meteor might have been the thing that killed off all the dinosaurs. They're just missing one thing. If a meteor impacts the Earth, it should leave a giant crater behind. As luck would have it, back in 1978, there was an engineer doing some surveys for an oil company. Now, this right here is the bottom end of Mexico. So here's the coastline, down here is Mexico, and then up here is the Gulf of Mexico. And he was using a technique called gravity anomaly mapping. What this is, is it's a way of being able to measure the density of the rock in a given area. It's useful for oil companies because oil is less dense than rock, and so if you find a huge patch of low density, then that tends to indicate there might be oil in that area. High density indicates interesting geological features, but probably not oil. And he was taking measurements in this area. And so in white right here is the coastline that you see here. Down here is the land area of Mexico. And up here is the Gulf of Mexico, the area that's covered by the sea. And this is a false color map representing the density of that area. So remember, low density is in blue, high density is in red. And you'll notice this really interesting ring pattern right about here. And that's not a normal feature that you see when you look at the geology of most regions. And so this was the first evidence that we really had of the crater. Unfortunately, he went and presented his findings at a conference, but it wasn't very well attended by the dinosaur extinction experts. And so his findings were published, but they weren't really made known to Walter and Luis Alvarez until about 20 years later. It took about that long for the dots to finally be connected and for people to finally be able to make that extinction, to make that association. But once we did finally make that association, we were able to go down, take some samples from this area, and find that, yes, this crater really is 65 million years old, about the same age as those iridium samples that we found over the world, and about the same time that the dinosaurs all went extinct. Now, I realize that most of us don't have the best grasp of Mexican geography, where exactly this is, how big exactly this is. So let me zoom things out. It's about this big. The crater is 180 kilometers in diameter. For scale, here's Cuba, here's Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. And so it's a pretty big impact crater that was left behind by what we think might have killed off the dinosaurs. Now, before I go any further into how that impact might have killed the dinosaurs, let me just summarize what we've gone over so far. So the first point is that the final event that killed off the dinosaurs wasn't the first mass extinction event. In fact, there were multiple mass extinction events that happened before and during the reign of the dinosaurs that caused loss of over half of the species on Earth. Most of these extinction events weren't due to meteors, or if they were, we don't think meteors played as major of a role as they might have in the final dinosaur extinction event. We think that it was more likely due to supervolcanoes, either one large volcano or multiple volcanoes going off in short succession. And the only reason that we think it was a meteor that killed off the dinosaurs in the very end is because we have solid evidence for a meteor impact. We have iridium that's deposited in geologic layers about the same age that the dinosaurs went away. And we also have a crater that happened around the same time the dinosaurs went extinct. So I'm going to pause for a minute before I continue on to the next half of my talk and take intermediate questions you guys might have. Yes, up in the back. I have two questions. Um, first question is, how do you have reliable information about how many species there were millions and millions of years ago, given that most of the time we find fossils and you know it's a fossil because there's a shell or a bone or something, but all sorts of stuff that's really far back didn't have a shell or a bone or something. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So the question is, how do we know how many species there were hundreds of million years ago when all we have are just shell fragments or sometimes not even a complete fossil? And for that question... Not even, not even a shell. I mean, if it's really, really old, there's no shell or, or backup, right? So right, right. And so if there's no evidence for the fossil, how do we know how many species there are? For this question, I'm actually going to defer to my pa partner, Matt, who's going to be talking to us about fossil records and species diversity. This is going to be the second half of the talk. Okay. Um, second question. You said the iridium all went into the center of 
the of the earth mm -hmm. um, when it was molten. Mm -hmm. is, is that because it's heavier than iron and, and, and nickel and, and the other element that you had? So the question is, why did all the iridium go to the center of the earth? And the answer is exactly what you suggested. It's heavier than iron and nickel and most of these other elements. And it, there's, all, there's all sorts of elements that are even heavier than iridium. Why is there no iridium, but there's all these heavier things than iridium before and after the event of the... Of sure. So there's heavier elements than iridium, like, let's say, uranium, plutonium, those sorts of things. And why are they found on the surface of the Earth, but not iridium? And the answer to this also has to do with some of the chemical properties of iridium. It binds very strongly to iron, and so that makes it much more able to be cycled in and out of the Earth's crust back to the core and back and forth. And because iridium is heavier than iron, it will preferentially go towards the core. And all the heavier things don't bind to iron? Things like uranium don't bind nearly as strongly to iron, and so the cycling is a lot less um, frequent than, say, with iridium. And so there's lots of opportunities for it to be able to go to the core. Other questions? Yes? So you mentioned the size of the crater, but what's the size of the actual we'll get, So the question is, what's the size of the asteroid, not the crater? We'll get to that in the second half of the talk. Don't worry. Yes? Right now, the, like, a, like a woman, when they go to the doctor, they, there are some machines, so you can scan the density of the bones, for example, to see if the bones are missing calcium or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. How is that, is doing the dinosaurs' bones, is any way to find a pattern or something, say, like, uh, oh, from these early uh, dinosaur um, bones to the early, this late stage in the history, this kind of bond uh, has these differences on the uh, has more calcium or has more these chemical e elements. Why is used to keep it to the? I don't, I don't know. It's like a, so many question marks when maybe so much chemicals can be in the in the or. The, I know the bonds can tell that maybe they have a little more history about what might happen. I don't, I don't know. It's so I'll let Matt take this question. Um, yes. Let me repeat the question first before um, you go into that. So the question is, it has something to do with the chemical composition of the bones and uh, how you might be able to measure those things? Um, well, I, I think you were asking about what, what can be learned from, the, from dinosaur bones. And actually, one thing that I'll touch on briefly in the second half um, is that dinosaur bones actually at, at one point during their evolution um, became um, much less dense, very similar to, uh, to bird bones, the way that we think of modern birds today. And so that's actually one of the pieces of, of evidence that dinosaurs did in fact evolve into birds. But I'll talk a lot more about that in general in a second. All right, one more. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the nuclear winter, you know, with the ash you know, forming a cloud in uh, You'd think there's like an absorptive thing going on with it. You know, it was absorbing the sunlight. You'd have like a global warming type of effect, similar to CO2. But is it because you've got more reflective material? It's actually bouncing the sunlight away. What's the mechanism there? Do you guys understand that? So the question is, all this ash that was spewed out by the volcanoes, why is it not causing anything like a global warming effect? Um, and the important thing to remember, actually, is it's not the heating of the Earth that matters. It's how much light is hitting the Earth for the plants to be able to do photosynthesis. Plants can't survive on heat alone, and they, they need actual sunlight to be able to produce their energy, their food. All right, so I'll go ahead and move on to the second half of the talk. And we're going to go into what were the effects of the meteor impact? How exactly would that meteor have killed off the dinosaurs? Now, I'll show this image again partially because I just like it, but partially because it also helps illustrate the point of most of the movies that you see, they show the meteors slamming to the Earth, and they show these really impressive scenes of the shockwave going through and destroying everything, but then it kind of just skips ahead to all the dinosaurs dying, and it doesn't really go into how exactly dinosaurs might have died off. And the reality of it actually has a lot less to do with the shockwave of the impact than you might think. So before we go into that, um, to address your question actually about exactly how big this asteroid was, we have here the Earth and the Moon roughly to scale. And to throw in a couple more things, uh, here is Texas to scale. And then here is Massachusetts also to scale. 
And I'm going to poll you guys. So I want to see a show of hands here. Your options are going to be, big, was the asteroid bigger than Texas, about the size of Texas, between Texas and Massachusetts, Massachusetts size, or something smaller than Massachusetts? So show of hands, who thinks it was bigger than Texas? Who thinks it was about the size of Texas? Who thinks it was somewhere in between? About the size of Massachusetts? Smaller than Massachusetts. Okay, for those of you who think it's smaller than Massachusetts, keep your hands up and lower your hands. Um, how many of you think it was half as big as Massachusetts? One quarter, one tenth. All right, what's your estimate? Uh, a tenth the size of Massachusetts. Your estimate's one tenth. What are the other hands I saw over here? One one thousandth, okay. Anyone else who had that vote of smaller than? Okay. So the asteroid was actually 10 kilometers in diameter. That's about 1 30th the size of Massachusetts. <laughs> here it is, right about here. Uh, some of you guys might be able to see it. It's this dot right here. Um, this is actually a little bit misleading too because the dot is the size of one pixel, which is the smallest thing that this computer can process. And one pixel on this resolution is actually 30 kilometers. So really, it should be one third of that dot that some of you might or might not be able to see. And the first thing that I thought when I saw this was, OK, well, I don't care how fast that asteroid is going. How could it possibly wipe out all life on Earth? And if you're thinking something similar, well, you're not alone. That's actually been kind of a point of contention within the scientific community in terms of was it really just the asteroid or was the asteroid some minor player or was it just or was it the asteroid plus something else that caused the dinosaurs to all go extinct so with that in mind let's talk about what exactly the effects of the asteroid impact might have been now most sound clips are copyrighted so i wasn't able to get some of them i shall improvise instead we'll start off with the impact all right <laughs> You had to have expected something like this was going to be coming along. <laughs> okay, so the asteroid slams into the Earth. Obviously, anything within the immediate impact area is going to be completely obliterated. Um, the asteroid also slams into the Earth with enough force to actually trigger earthquakes and tidal waves all over the planet. But that's within the first couple of hours after it hits. Kills off a couple of animals, a lot of plants, and that's all fine and dandy. After the impact happens, uh, it shoots off a bunch of debris into the air. These are little pieces of rock that are ejected by the force of the impact. And when I say they're shot up into the air, they're actually shot out of the atmosphere into the range of low Earth orbit. And so they build up a huge amount of what's called potential energy. This is the energy that you have from just being high up and eventually getting pulled down by gravity. And when this debris, when these rock fragments come back to the Earth, most of them end up burning up in the atmosphere. As they do so, they release a ton of heat. And the heat released by this falling rock burning up in the atmosphere, along with the heat pulse released by this asteroid impact, is enough to trigger massive forest fires all over the world. And so this also takes out a lot of the plant life. Now, all of that eventually subsides after a couple of weeks. The real danger comes from the dust cloud that's kicked up by the asteroid. There's dust from both the impact and also from the asteroid itself vaporizing upon impact. That's the source of the iridium that we found all over the Earth. But you also remember I mentioned earthquakes were happening at the time that the asteroid hit. It was that powerful of an impact. And there were actually a cluster of volcanoes in India in what's now known as the Deccan Traps region that were actually, they were about to erupt and the force of the asteroid impact was enough to trigger them to all erupt at roughly the same moment. And so you remember how we talked at the very beginning about supervolcanoes. Well, imagine supervolcanoes all being triggered by this asteroid, all these volcanoes opening up at the same time. They'll also be releasing a lot of ash. And so all this ash combines and goes up into the atmosphere and blankets the Earth in a cover of darkness. And this ash actually remains suspended for 10 whole years. And so that's 10 whole years during which not a whole lot of sunlight can really get through to the Earth. And what happens when sunlight can't reach the Earth? Plants die off. And remember, once the plants die off, there's nothing for the animals to eat, and so they'll also die off. Ten years of famine, 
enough to wipe out many, many species on the planet. Now, the fact that we're all sitting here today, alive and breathing, is clear indication that not everything died off. Some animals were able to cling on to survival. And so here is kind of a different version of the food chain diagram I showed you guys earlier. At the bottom, remember, we have the primary producers, the plants that provide food for everything else. We have the herbivores, the plant eaters that eat the plants, and then the carnivores, the meat eaters that eat the other animals. I'm going to introduce a new animal type up here called the omnivores. These are animals that can eat both plants and a other animals. They'll in turn serve as food for other higher level carnivores. Now, we're going to start off with the asteroid impact killing off most of the plant life on Earth. And when this happens, the larger herbivores, they don't have enough food to be able to support them. So things like triceratops, they'll die off because each triceratops cannot find all the plants that it needs to be able to support that much body mass. The smaller herbivores, things like insects, there's not going to be enough plants to support all of them either. So some of them are going to die off. But not all of them are going to die off. Some of them, because the, insect, because the smaller herbivores require less plant material to survive, some of them can find enough to be able to live on. Now, as these small herbivores die off, the smaller carnivores that rely on them, they're not going to be able to find enough food, and so a lot of them are going to die off. The omnivores, on the other hand, the animals that can eat both plants and animals, they'll have more options available to them, and so they won't be hit quite as hard by this whole starvation scenario that's happening all over the Earth, and so they'll be able to fare a little bit better. But unfortunately for the larger carnivores, they're going to have the same problem as these larger herbivores. They're not going to be able to find enough food to support an individual Lothraptor or an individual Tyrannosaurus. And so they'll die off, and you'll have a loss of a lot of the larger dinosaurs that we commonly see in movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Now, not everything was struggling for survival in this post-apocalyptic environment. There were actually a couple of animal species that thrived in this environment. One of them were a class known as the decomposers. So when plants and animals die, they don't just spontaneously disappear. All that organic matter has to go somewhere, and it tends to go into things that we usually think of as the creepy, crawly things. I'm talking things like insects, slugs, and, and fungi above the earth. Below the earth, you also have worms, bacteria, and also other soil, mushroom soil fungi. These are decomposers. They take dead or decaying organic matter, and they break it down. They use it as food for themselves. And because there's so much dead and decaying organic matter, all the plants are dying off, all the animals are dying off, these species actually have abundant sources of food. And so they'll, fare, they'll be able to do very well during these 10 years when most things are dying off. There's also one class of communities that does very well during this whole mass extinction event, and that's stream communities. This is not to be confused with ocean communities. These are more rivers, creeks, that sort of thing. And they obey slightly different rules than land or ocean-based environments because a lot of their food actually comes from runoff, dead matter that dies and is eventually washed into the stream by rain, wind, various erosion forces. And as all of this organic wa matter washes into the rivers, it provides a lot of food for the animals that are living there. And so rather than starving, these animals are actually going to thrive and do very well during the mass extinction events. And so eventually, these animals give rise to what we see today. The small animals, the omnivores survive, the decomposers survive, and animals that live in stream communities survive. Nonetheless, we fall in the category of larger animals. Each of us requires a lot more food than, say, a mouse. And so it's in our best interest to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. And so what's the likelihood of that happening again, and what can we do about it? This is a map of asteroid impacts on the Earth over just a period of 20 years, from 1994 to 2013. And most of these are actually small asteroids. They burn up in the atmosphere long before they ever hit the Earth's surface, fortunately. But you'll notice that there's quite a lot of them. Now, one thing I'll emphasize is that the size of these dots does not correspond to the actual size of the rock that was hitting the Earth. Uh, if we were to put the actual size of the rock, you would not be able to see it on this diagram. The size actually corresponds to how much energy it released as it burned up in the atmosphere. And I'll point out one of these specifically to you. That's a meteor that exploded over a town called Chelyabinsk in Russia. Some of you might remember it from last year. There were videos shot from various dashboard cameras, from various security cameras of this impact that happened over this Russian town. 
And this meteor, which is on the larger side of meteors that hit on this whole map, it exploded with a force of about 20 to 30 atomic bombs. And when I was first putting this lecture together, uh, they asked me if I could possibly put the dinosaur killer on this map also to scale. And, well, here's the thing. If this meteor exploded with a force of 20 to 30 atomic bombs, the one that killed the dinosaurs, we estimate the energy to be not 1,000 atomic bombs, not 10,000, not a million, not 100 million, but 1 billion atomic bombs. So when I saw that number, I thought, yeah, I'm not going to bother trying to figure out some way to put that on this map. So I'll try to explain it to you guys in a different way. If you imagine your average one in the middle parking space, in a city like Boston, the average width of that parking space is about 2.3 meters. Line six and a half of them side by side. And that's about how big the Chelyabinsk object was. This was a meteor that exploded over Russia. The one that killed the dinosaurs was about 10 kilometers in diameter. That's 10,000 meters as compared to 15 meters. So how big would that be? Well, if this is, fifth, this is six and a half parking spaces, 10 kilometers, this is a map of Boston. We're right about here in the Longwood Amphitheater. And a 10 kilometer object is about this big. So right over here, this pond represents the end of the Green Line C branch. Up here is the Harvard main campus. And over here is Logan Airport. So that's about how big 10 kilometers is. And you can imagine many, many parking spaces fitting within that area. This is just the size of the rock that would have hit the Earth. And so, yes, it was small in comparison to the entire Earth, but it's still pretty darn big. And does anyone remember how big the crater was that was left behind? 108 kilometers. So if we zoom this map out, 108 kilometers is about this big. So here's the upper end of Massachusetts, here's the lower end of Massachusetts, here's Rhode Island. Just to put things in a little bit more of a to-home context for you guys. Luckily for us, these sorts of impacts occur exceedingly rarely. So the bigger the asteroid is, the much less probability that it's going to hit the Earth because there's just fewer of them in our solar system. These types of impacts have a possibility of threatening the Earth about once every 100 million years or so. And NASA has thought about this at multiple points in the past. And they have a thing called the Near Earth Object Program, which its goal is to characterize all the large asteroids in the solar system that could potentially pose a threat to the Earth and map out their trajectories. And I'd actually encourage you guys to go to this website. So if you go to our website, Science and News, you can look it up on Google. You can pull up our lecture slides and you'll be able to find this link in our lecture slides. If you go to this website, you can actually find a list of all the asteroids that are of large enough size to threaten the Earth. And what's really cool is you can actually click on each of these asteroids, and it'll pull up one of these diagrams, which shows you the asteroid, its orbital path, and here is the Earth's orbital path right here. And you actually play around with this. So you can press one of these buttons down here, and it'll actually do a nice animation that'll show all these things going around in circles, tell you what date at what day everything's going to be in what position. And it's really fun. And you can be able to do this for all the asteroids that we know of that are big enough to be able to threaten the Earth. So, to summarize this part of the talk, it wasn't really the shock wave of the meteor impact. It wasn't the, vol it wasn't the earthquakes or the tidal waves caused by it that killed off the dinosaurs. It was really the ash causing mass starvation that killed off the dinosaurs. And we actually think it was both volcanoes and the asteroid impact that killed off the dinosaurs. Neither one alone, but both of them combining together to occlude the sun and block out sunlight and kill off the plants and then kill off the dinosaurs by extension. Animals that were better able to survive were smaller animals that required less food for each individual animal and also omnivores that are able to make use of more diverse food sources. And some communities actually weren't struggling for survival. They actually had an abundance of food and thrived during the extinction. So with that, before we go into intermission, I'd like to take any final questions that you guys might have. Yes? So I was wondering, what happened to the oceans? What happened to the oceans during this mass extinction event? 
Yeah, so the oceans were actually subject to very similar extinctions as happened on land. You remember the food chain diagrams I showed you at the beginning. On land, all ecosystems are based on plants. In the ocean, we have something similar called phytoplankton. These are small organisms that also take energy from the sun and convert it into food for all the other fish that live in the ocean. And when the sunlight goes out, then they die off and all the fish also starve. And yes? I actually have not heard about an asteroid coming by the Earth around Halloween, but maybe you can talk to me afterwards. We can look, at, look it up and figure that out. So there were, so I mentioned before the detrivores and the stream communities on land being able to thrive during the extinction event, and is there any analogous community in the oceans? And the answer is yes. On the sea floor, there's animals that also feed on dead matter that eventually goes down to the bottom of the ocean and just stays there. And they also would have been able to thrive during this time. You. So the question is, does a KT layer, the clay layer uh, that was around, that was full of iridium, does it vary in thickness globally? And I actually don't know the answer to that one. I don't know if anyone else here does, no? Not really. Not really? Uh, you know, obviously a little bit, but not, not as much as you would think. Okay, so yeah. Um, you, can also, you can also imagine that if there's dust that's being floating around in the atmosphere for about 10 years, that's enough time for it to all kind of normalize and settle in roughly equal amounts all over the Earth. Yes. So you mentioned this 10 year period where Ash's number was described. How, how is this number estimated? I'm sorry? How is this number, the 10 years, how is it uh, estimated? How do we know it's about 10 years that the ash was covering the Earth? Uh, if you drill down the rock layers, you can actually date them by roughly how old the rock is, and you can look at the thickness of those layers and get a rough estimate for how much time that spanned. Yes. Uh, the KT uh, layer, it's, it's clay. Why is it clay as opposed to like sand or something? Why is a KT layer made out of clay as opposed to sand? I actually do not have a good answer to that question. I'm not familiar with different types of soils and what they're made out of. But if I had to take a guess, I would assume different types of soil are defined by the size of the particles that make them up. And this could have something to do with just the particles that were floating around and eventually settled down on the earth. But I don't know just for sure. Do you see a hand raise over here? No? Okay. Thanks, Vinny. Um, my name's Matt Schwartz. I'm a seventh year graduate student um, here at Harvard. Uh, and um, I'm going to tell you now about what a dinosaur actually is and how they evolved into birds. And now that we're halfway through the talk, I thought it would be important for you guys to know what a dinosaur actually is. So you may have some vague notion of what a dinosaur is. Um, and just to let you know, all of these things up here are, in fact, all dinosaurs. Uh, and we'll get into why throughout the talk. And as Vinny said, uh, just before I get started, um, for the lab tour, we'll be going to my lab, uh, and we work on um, patterning uh, the vertebrate limb. So I'll be showing you um, some skeletons of uh, various embryos, uh, bird embryos, uh, mouse embryos, and some eggs, uh, as well as uh, live chicken embryos. So if you're interested in coming to that, uh, just um, meet in the front after the, uh, after the end of the lecture. So uh, what is a dinosaur? So first, I'll, I'll tell you what a dinosaur is, and then I'll tell you how birds uh, might have survived, or in fact did survive, the, uh, the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. And then we'll take a brief break for questions, and then for, uh, and then for the second half of the talk, I'll tell you what uh, anatomical evidence exists that birds evolved from dinosaurs, and then finally conclude with what behavioral evidence exists that uh, birds evolved from dinosaurs. So first, to understand what a dinosaur is, you have to understand what a vertebrate is. Um, and a vertebrate is uh, any animal that has a backbone. So uh, a backbone is this thing right here. Um, you, you all have one. Um, and you, um, you, may, you may remember from um, 
from high school biology or before that, uh, hearing about these five uh, classes of vertebrates, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. But that actually isn't quite um, the full picture. Because, well, for one, where are dinosaurs? Um, and so that's the first question that I hope to address. So before I tell you what are dinosaurs, I'm going to ask you whether you think these are dinosaurs. So raise your hand if you think this is a dinosaur. Well, you're all correct. Now, raise your hand if you think this is a dinosaur. It turns out it's not. Um, so this is actually a pelicosaur, which is actually more closely related to mammals, like all of us, than it is to the dinosaurs. Uh, so this is a common misconception that any large reptilian-looking creature that we have fossils for is a dinosaur, but that's not actually the case. Next, do you think this is a dinosaur? Well, this one's not a dinosaur either. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pterosaur, or as you might have heard of them, um, one species of pterosaur are pterodactyls. Um, and in fact, uh, pterosaurs are very closely related to dinosaurs. Um, they're, they're actually flying reptiles. Um, they're more closely related to dinosaurs than crocodiles are. And crocodiles, um, besides for birds, which are actually dinosaurs, crocodiles are the closest real living relatives to dinosaurs. Now, how about this one? Do you guys think this is a dinosaur? Well, now that I've confused you enough, I'll tell you that this one is also not actually a dinosaur. This is, in fact, a plesiosaur. Uh, in fact, dinosaurs only lived on land. There were no dinosaurs in the air and no dinosaurs in the water. Um, but again, these uh, people often think that these were dinosaurs because they're giant creatures that have bones. Um, but <laughs> plesiosaurs actually are more closely related to lizards and snakes than they are to dinosaurs or birds or crocodiles or turtles. And then this last one. Do you guys think this is a dinosaur? Yes. Yeah. Well, so I've already sort of hinted at this, but birds are all dinosaurs. And this is a common pheasant. Um, so it is definitely a dinosaur. But we'll get more into that throughout the talk. So, um, like I said, the picture of how vertebrates are organized is actually a lot more complicated. Um, so this is even, in fact, a simplification of, uh, of how vertebrates are related. So just to um, orient you here, on the top we have a geologic time scale. So this is from present day here at zero to uh, 400 million years ago. And so this is, this is uh, called a cladogram. And what a cladogram is, it's the way that um, scientists organize how species are related. So it's based on uh, shared uh, traits, so what, understanding when a trait evolved within a, a lineage. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm referring to a lineage as any group of, um, of species which share uh, a common ancestor. And so, so scientists use cladograms like this, using traits and now also DNA sequences, in order to know how to organize what, sp what species are most closely related. So what's a dinosaur? Well, first, we have to uh, go over a few other groups. So uh, right now, I've highlighted all the amniotes. Amniotes include uh, mammals like us, also birds, and everything that we think of as reptiles. So these are basically amniotes or anything that have an embryo that's surrounded by a membrane. So this doesn't include amphibians, lobe and fish, or ray and fish, or other fish that I've left off uh, of this chart. Next. I've highlighted all the reptiles. So you probably think of reptiles as lizards and snakes, and also as turtles, and also crocodiles. But in fact, um, there are more reptiles than, the, than just those groups. All birds are also reptiles, because reptiles describe the, every creature which um, shares the last common ancestor of lizards and snakes and turtles and crocodiles, which also includes birds, as well as all of these groups that went extinct um, uh, around the time of the dinosaurs at the KT boundary. So next, what are dinosaurs? Well, this is, this is the million dollar question. So dinosaurs are what I've highlighted here in blue. 
Um, and how, how do they differ? Well, I'll get to that over the next few slides, but for right now I'll tell you that these are dinosaurs. And I'll go through just briefly what these groups are. So Ornith Ornithischians are the oldest group of dinosaurs, so that includes dinosaurs like the Stegosaurus or the Triceratops. And then the next oldest group of dinosaurs are the, are the sauropods. That includes the largest dinosaurs to ever walk the Earth, including the Brontosaurus and the Diplodocus. And then this next group, that I've highlighted here in orange, they're the theropod dinosaurs. Theropods are the bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs um, that are depicted in movies. So that's the T-Rex and the Velociraptor, and also the birds, because, it was, because birds evolved from these dinosaurs. And then I'm going to show you one more group here. Um, so this doesn't include the T-Rex, but it just includes birds and the most recent uh, non-avian dinosaur, uh, non-avian dinosaurs that are related to birds. And so that group is called the Maniraptors. So what is a dinosaur? Well, we still have to answer that question. So dinosaurs were first named in 1842 by a paleontologist by the name of Sir Richard Owen. Uh, he was a British paleontologist. That's his picture right there. Um, he doesn't look very happy in that picture. <laughs> but he named, uh, he named dinosaurs um, based off of dinos, which means terrible, and sauros, which means lizard. It comes from the Greek. Um, and he intended the name to, uh, to evoke their size and majesty, since the bones that were being found were gigantic, which is, again, why people have the tendency to call any large fossils dinosaurs. Um, and so he used uh, three dinosaurs which had been found to, uh, in order to create this description of dinosaurs. So prior to his work, three dinosaurs had been described in, to, um, in, sci in the scientific literature. That was the Megalosaurus, the Iguanodon, and the Hylosaurus. But it actually turns out that people have probably been aware of dinosaurs for a lot longer. Uh, and in fact, the oldest uh, written record of what we think refers to dinosaurs is actually from the fourth century BC from a Chinese historian. Um, and uh, he, he claimed to have found dragon fossils. So we, th so we think that the legends for dragons actually came from finding dinosaur fossils. And in fact, there are suggestions that other, uh, other mythological legends also come from, uh, from people who stumbled upon dinosaur bones. But what actually is a dinosaur? Well, so the, uh, strictly, strictly speaking, dinosaurs were, were first, um, first defined as having uh, an, erect hip, an erect posture for standing as opposed to a sprawling posture for standing. So dinosaurs evolved from a shared common ancestor with, uh, with crocodiles and pterosaurs. Um, and so uh, cr that ancestor, uh, called an archosaur, would have walked just like this, just like modern crocodiles do um, today, with their legs uh, splayed out uh, from their pelvis. But what dinosaurs evolved, they evolved holes in their pelvis. So what this hole does, it allows dinosaurs to have a hip socket, which allows them to stand erect like this. And by, because dinosaurs are able to stand like that, it makes breathing easier as they move and allows for higher activity, which is what allows dinosaurs to be uh, warm-blooded. And it also allows dinosaurs to support more weight and reduces bending stress. Um, so, just to bring you back to the cladogram, I want to show you where, where these traits belong. So, like I said, ancestors of dinosaurs had this sprawling posture, so that includes uh, modern-day crocodiles, but then when dinosaurs evolved, all dinosaurs had this erect posture. So now, dinosaur, now I want to review the timeline of dinosaurs with you. Martin went over this, so I'll go through it quickly. But dinosaurs originated around 230 million years ago in the early Triassic period. And then they went extinct, um, except for non, uh, or non avian dinosaurs went extinct. Birds are still around, obviously. Um, but that happened about 65 million years ago. And then, um, so Martin told you that um, humans evolved much more recently than this, but actually our most recent hominid ancestors, so when, um, when hominids split from chimpanzees, was about 7 million years ago, just to give you some perspective. Um, so dinosaurs were the dominant life form on Earth for 135 million years, so the time from, from here to around here. Um, but that's actually 19 times longer than the amount of time that's actually been since we split from chimpanzees. So dinosaur, dinosaurs ruled the Earth for a lot longer than anything even resembling a human has existed. And in fact, dinosaurs ruled the Earth for twice as long as they've even been extinct. 
So now, how might have birds survived the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs? Um, so Martin alluded to this in, in his food web. So I want to give you guys a chance um, to offer up a suggestion. Do, do any of you have any idea what might have helped di uh, birds survive where dinosaurs went extinct? Yeah? Birds uh, that's true. So some of them, some of them can eat um, the dead animals that were still around. Exactly. Um, any other, any other ideas? Uh, birds have better mobility. Fly to uh, like areas of food. Also true. Birds have better mobility, so they could they could find food better. Uh, any anything else? Something that Martin had actually already already said. How about seeds? Um, well, so there, there, would have, there would have been some seeds left, definitely, from, uh, from when a lot of the plants were destroyed. There still could have been seeds, which they still could have eaten. Um, I'll, um, I'll give you guys one. What? Exactly. Dinosaur, dinosaurs were huge, but birds, all the birds we know of today, are a lot smaller than what we think of dinosaurs being. So, could their size have helped birds survive? Well, first I want to depict to you just how big dinosaurs are. So right here, I'm showing you a human on the left, um, and this is drawn to scale. These, were, these are the largest dinosaur in five different groups of dinosaurs, just to give you some perspective on how large these groups of dinosaurs were all evolving to be. Um, in fact, this largest one here, which is a sauropod, it was 39 meters long. For those of you that don't, uh, aren't as familiar with the metric system, 39 meters is about 130 feet. Uh, so that's an enormous animal, and it's estimated to have weighed about 50 tons. So dinosaurs were huge. There's no denying that dinosaurs were huge. Um, and in fact, most dinosaurs were actually getting bigger. So dinosaur lineages over time, so as we get to more recent history, from, from more ancient history to more recent history, this is a plot of sauropod dinosaurs. Again, these are the dinosaurs like the Brontosaurus or the Diplodocus, uh, the largest dinosaurs to ever walk the Earth. Uh, and so as they got more specialized and became, these, uh, became sauropods after being these uh, original uh, pro-sauropods, you can see that over time uh, they were actually getting larger. So this is their total length. But I just told you that birds are small. Um, so if most dinosaurs were getting larger, is it possible that birds were doing something different? Well, that's actually what, exactly what was happening. So um, while all these other lineages of dinosaurs were getting much larger, uh, theropod dinosaurs, the dinosaurs that would evolve into birds, were actually getting smaller. And not just a little bit smaller, but drastically smaller. So avian dinosaurs, their lineage, is, lineage decreased in size 160 times faster than the other dinosaur lineages were increasing in size, suggesting that actually this decrease in size had a lot more benefit than the increase in size might have been having towards their evolution. So just to give you an example of this, these are four of these Maniraptor uh, dinosaurs, the closest dinosaurs uh, to modern birds, uh, but that are still non-avian. Uh, to give you some perspective on their size, they were quite a bit smaller than humans, uh, and, and obviously much, much smaller than the dinosaurs that I showed you um, two slides ago. Um, and so this small size allowed avian dinosaurs to better survive this extinction event um, this uh, KT extinction, and then they diversified 66 million years ago to fulfill all the niches that became available to them when all these dinosaurs were gone uh, from the Earth. And then there's one other thing that might have helped, uh, that might have helped birds survive, and that's because birds might actually have been a lot smarter than dinosaurs. And so how, how can we really have any idea about that? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so what I'm showing you here are the phenomenon of pedomorphic skulls. And so I'm, I'm going to explain what that means. Basically, pedomorphic evolution is a type of evolution in which uh, a species evolves by stalling its own development. So during embryonic development, an animal goes from being a single cell to being a large complex organism. But so what, uh, through pedomorphic evolution, what a species is doing, um, of course none of this is intentional, but what, what happens um, is that development of some aspects of, uh, of, their, of their species will uh, go slower, whereas other aspects will continue to develop. So in the case of birds, they manage to um, to slow down the development of their heads, um, in fact, their whole bodies uh, compared or compared to their heads, whereas they were still able to um, to reproduce. So, in effect, 
Birds are like dinosaur babies that can reproduce. Um, and so why is this important? Well, you may know that human babies have a much larger head than, than human adults. Um, and I want to emphasize here that larger head does not equal smarter. Um, I want to be really clear about that. Just because you have a larger head doesn't mean that a species or an animal is smarter. But in closely related lineages, such as avian dinosaurs and non-avian dinosaurs, the more closely related species are, if their head gets larger compared to their more closely related species, uh, usually that is suggestive of greater intelligence. So what I'm showing you here uh, are juvenile skulls and adult skulls for three different species. On the top is an alligator. So this is just like an alligator you know. Um, and so these are not to scale. So you know that an adult alligator is actually much larger than uh, a juvenile alligator. And so the, basically the, the length of the skull has just been uh, normalized so that it's the same in all of these pictures here, just so we can compare the shape. Um, and so you can see that the, the head of the juvenile is a lot larger than, um, than the adult, even though the adult is larger in terms of total size. The, the space for the brain is smaller. And the same is true for uh, this dinosaur here. It's an early dinosaur. Again, the adult form has a much larger snout. But if you look at Archaeopteryx, um, which I'll tell you more about in the second half, which we actually think it was the first bird, you can see that uh, it's, these skulls actually look almost identical. It's just that this one would have been larger as an adult, but scaled, they look the same, um, suggesting that the adults are, uh, do have larger, uh, larger brains and might actually have been more intelligent in this case. But again, larger brains does not always equal smarter just in the case of closely related lineages. Um, and so just how smart are birds? Well, I'm going to show you. So just to set the stage for this, you're about to see a video of a crow, um, a, a new Caledonian crow to be exact. And so these crows are great at solving puzzles. And so what you're going to see is a, a, a cylinder, um, and it has a, a, a piece of aluminum, and it's going to bend the piece of aluminum in order to put that p curved piece of aluminum into the cylinder in order to take out the trapped food that it needs to use this, that needs to curve this piece of aluminum to pull it out. And so now you'll hopefully understand what you're seeing. Uh, as long as this plays. Okay, here it goes. It's 20 seconds. So it's straight right now. It just bent it and it put and it put it in and you see how it grabbed the hook on top and pulled out the food and now it can eat it. I'm going to show you that one more time since it was fast. The crow picks up its tool, watch it bend it, just bent it there, and now it sticks in the curved piece of aluminum again to pull out its food. So birds are actually really smart. People just don't necessarily realize how, just how smart that they are. So it may be that this increased intelligence helped them survive, whereas uh, non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. So to summarize the first half for you, uh, first I'll tell you that um, dinosaurs are vertebrates, uh, which evolved an erect hip stance um, with pelvic sockets compared to their common archosaurian ancestors. Most dinosaurs were increasing in size, but the ancestors of birds were actually decreasing in size long before the KT extinction. Um, and in fact, it looks like that was evolutionarily advantageous even to the non-avian dinosaurs that were smaller. And it seems that birds have pedomorphic skulls. Uh, so they stalled, the they stalled the development of their brains with respect, or sorry, the development of the size of their skulls with, uh, with respect to their body size in order to have a larger head compared to their body. Um, and so now I'll pause for questions before we go on to the second half. Why do you think the, the bird ancestors were getting smaller? What was driving them to become smaller? That, great question. Um, so uh, uh, most dinosaurs were huge. So there actually were a lot of niches available to anything that could exploit uh, the uh, some a smaller a smaller niche that's available. So so there were there were some small mammals around, um, and a dinosaur wouldn't want to eat them, or a, a giant massive dinosaur like the sar well sauropods are are, are uh, herbivorous, but a giant dinosaur like a T. Rex wouldn't want to eat a small mammal. But if there's a lot of them running around, that's a great food source. So it makes sense that um, some dinosaurs would want to decrease their size in order to take advantage of a food source like that. 
if all of the theropods were getting smaller, why is it that we only have the theropods that evolved from ancestors that could fly still around? Um, so all theropods weren't getting smaller. I might have been unclear about that. The, um, the lineages that were leading directly towards birds were getting smaller. Uh, so, just, uh, so there were lots of other theropods. There were a very diverse group of dinosaurs, and a lot of them were, in fact, very large, like the T-Rex. Um, but it was just the ones that were directly evolving into, the, into birds that were getting smaller. Okay, great. If there's no other questions, I will continue on with the second half of the talk. Um, so, I'll bring you back to the outline. Um, so first, in the second half, we'll go over the anatomical evidence for, uh, that birds evolved from dinosaurs, and then we'll go into the behavioral evidence. So, the very first piece of evidence, and maybe the most important, was the discovery of the Archaeopteryx in 1861. To give you a little bit of pers perspective on the timing, Darwin wrote the origin of the, of, on the origin of species two years before this, in 1859, and he speculated that, there, that, that scientists would find fossils that looked like transitionary forms between uh, different groups of animals that we knew about, uh, but we didn't have any of those fossils. So this was really the original non Missing link. And you think of a missing link fossil as being a fossil that we are looking for that might explain a gap in the record uh, to understand how creatures are related. But this was the first non-missing link. In fact, this Archaeopteryx shares many features with birds and also many reptilian features. So it wasn't really clear what this, what this was at first. So um, like birds, it has wings and feathers, but like reptiles, it has a tail, a long tail, I should say, um, and claws and teeth. Um, but actually, it turns out that, and this is based off a lot more work that happened later, birds actually share over 100 anatomical features with dinosaurs, um, which has given a lot more support to this idea that, that um, birds evolved from dinosaurs. But at the time, this was the only evidence that existed. Um, and so um, this, this Archaeopteryx was actually uh, found in part by Sir Richard Owen, the same person who had named what dinosaurs were, um, but, he, uh, but it actually was someone else um, in 1868 who really started pushing the idea that this, that this Archaeopteryx, this first bird, evolved from dinosaurs. And that was someone by the name of Thomas Henry Huxley, um, sometimes called Darwin's bullfrog, uh, because he was really the person who, who pushed Darwin's ideas and really um, helped lead towards, um, towards the acceptance of evolution by natural selection. But there were still competing theories for a long time. And uh, not as long as, you know, time scales that dinosaurs lived on, but a long time uh, for, for science. So it really wasn't until 1964 that it was um, completely accepted that dinosaurs or that birds evolved from dinosaurs and are dinosaurs. And it was John Ostrom's discovery of the Deinonychus that really sparked um, this uh, sparked this dinosaur renaissance and the knowledge that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And it was because Deinonychus, pictured uh, pictured here with John Ostrom. Uh, wasn't this massive dinosaur like the ones that we knew about. It was smaller. It was similar to the size of a person. You can see it right next to him. Um, but what was more important about it was that it w it's an agile, active predator, um, which suggested that dinosaurs were warm-blooded. So prior to the discovery of Deinonychus, everyone thought that uh, dinosaurs were just these slow, massive, plodding lizards um, that just couldn't move. Uh, but when, when it was discovered that they have these, that Deinonychus has these claws, which were clearly being used to hunt and, and, and rip open their prey, um, it was clear that this must have been a warm-blooded animal. Um, but that's not the only evidence that we got from Deinonychus. There were actually a few other pieces of important evidence. Um, so if you look at the forelimb of Deinonychus, it looks just like this here. And there are three digits. And if you, compare, if you compare the forelimb to an Archaeopteryx, the first bird, again, you can see that there are also three digits. And they're pretty much the same size as well. And if you look at a chicken, also a modern bird, uh, and this is a skeletal prep similar to ones that you'll see if you come on the lab tour, um, again, uh, the same configuration, three digits, although modern birds uh, have actually fused the second and third digit together. So you can see that here. Um, but these Manny Raptor and dinosaurs actually have bird-like forelimbs before, before they were birds. Um, so I also want to tell you about one more feature here, the semilunate carpal. So a carpal bone is uh, a bone in your wrist, 
Um, that's the name, a ge general term. But what a semilunate carpal is, it, it, it's, um, it's particular to birds and also to these Manny Raptoran dinosaurs. And so what it, what it does, it's this bone here. Um, and it controls how um, Deinonychus and other Manny Raptoran dinosaurs, and also birds, how they're able to move their wrist. So I want you all to hold out your hand in front of you. Uh, I'm going to explain to you how this works. Now, imagine if you could just so try moving your pinky towards your arm. It'll stop about here, like I'm showing you. But now imagine if you could move it all the way against your arm so that your pinky were facing back towards you. So that's what this semilunate carpal bone allows them to do. Uh, and that's actually really important for how uh, birds behave. So it allows them to flap their wings, and it also allows them to cover themselves with their wings when they want to fold them up. So if they didn't have the semilunate carpal bone, they wouldn't be able to fly. And so it evolved before, before dinosaurs, before birds were flying. Uh, and another important feature of birds is, is feathers. Um, so if, bir if birds evolved from dinosaurs, then you'd expect dinosaurs to have feathers if Archaeopteryx had feathers. And that is definitely the case. There have been over 40 theropods. So theropods, again, are those dinosaurs that include the T-Rex and the Velociraptor, Deinonychus, and all birds. Um, that there are over 40 theropod dinosaurs, non-avian non dinosaurs, um, that, uh, that have feathers that have been discovered since the 1990s. And this, this was really um, the last piece of evidence that, that was needed to fully support this hypothesis that birds uh, that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And in fact, there's actually some evidence that uh, protofeathers, uh, very early structures that might have later evolved into feathers, might have actually been even, even present in ornithi ornithi ornithischian dinosaurs, like the, uh, uh, which were, again, the more earlier evolved dinosaurs, like the Triceratops or the Stegosaurus. And there's even some evidence that uh, uh, a different structure called um, Pycnofibers uh, are that they're present in pterosaurs. So again, pterosaurs are flying lizards uh, that I showed you in the beginning that are commonly thought of as dinosaurs, but are not dinosaurs, but are just closely related. And so they have structures which, which might also be similar to feathers, which might suggest that feathers actually are even older. But uh, it still really remains an open question whether those things are the same as feathers or not. And so these are just these pictures here are just two, two different dinosaurs to show you that there were feathers um, on them, not just on the forelimbs in this case, but actually on the hind limbs also. Um, and same thing here. So I want to go over with you the, uh, the traits again, um, just to remind you how birds evolved from dinosaurs. So the ancestor of all dinosaurs and, and all archosaurs um, had five digits. So that's in the hand, five digits on the hand, just like we do. But then um, theropod dinosaurs, so again, that's the T-Rex, Velociraptor, and modern birds, as well as all their other closely related dinosaurs, they would evolve, uh, they would first lose their uh, fourth digit, and, um, and and then they, so first they would, sorry, first they would lose their fifth digit, and then they would lose their fourth digit, and so they would reduce their hand down to three digits, just like I so showed you in Deinonychus, and they also developed feathers. So that means that, yes, the T-Rex had feathers. Um, and uh, I haven't talked about these things, but also these theropod dinosaurs evolved hollow bones and a wishbone, which are both crucial for uh, modern avian flight, hollow bones making birds lighter, and a wishbone, which is an important structure for attaching muscles for flight. And then it was these Manny Raptoran dinosaurs, so the common ancestor of the Velociraptor and birds, which would evolve the semilunate carpal bone that I demonstrated to you that would help, uh, that would help them, uh, help birds be able to fly, um, which also incidentally means that in Jurassic Park, a Velociraptor could not open a door, um, but that's, that's for a, another day. Um, but, uh, and also these, um, these Manny Raptorans evolved an enlarged keel, and a keel is, is this large extension of the sternum which is found in modern birds. And then lastly, um, we know that birds aren't identical to non-avian dinosaurs, so there must be some other traits that they evolved on their own. And so, so they evolved a toothless beak, they lost their teeth, uh, they shortened their tails, uh, and they fused digits two and three, like I already showed you in the modern chicken. So for the last couple slides, we'll just go over a few pieces of behavioral evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And you're probably asking yourself, well, how do we have behavioral evidence? I, we've been talking about how non even dinosaurs are all extinct. And there actually is behavioral evidence from the fossil record, just like there's anatomical evidence. 
So there's evidence that dinosaurs exhibited brooding behavior. So what you're looking at here is a nest. Um, you can see the eggs here, and this is a presumably a mother or father dinosaur um, over guarding the nest, uh, and its wings, or not wings, I'm sorry, it doesn't have wings, its, fore, its forelimbs are outstretched over the eggs, um, in, in effect looking like it's covering them to protect them. And so this is a, a, a fossil of a city, uh, city pata, pati, um, and so these nests are preserved with these outstretched arms, which looks identical to how birds sit over their nests. They brood over them, they hold their wings out to protect their eggs. There's also fossil evidence of parental care. So um, in Egg Mountain, Montana in 1977, there was an extensive colony of Myasaura discovered. Um, so the, they nested in these massive colonies, and all of these nests were fossilized together. So there's, you can see all, all a different range of, um, of embryonic and juvenile dinosaurs coming from these nests. Uh, so you can see dinosaurs like this that were just hatching from their egg, and you can see nests like this full of, of juveniles being, uh, being cared for by nearby adults. And in fact, there's even been um, regurgitated vegetation found within these nests. And the, the fossil juveniles are found in these nests for up to two months of their life, or what's estimated to be two months based off of uh, how they might have been growing. And then the last piece of behavioral evidence that, that I want to show you uh, is gastroliths. And so what's a gastrolith? A gastrolith is a rock. Um, but it's a special rock because it's a rock that animals eat. So you may not even know this, but, but a lot of birds eat rocks. Um, and they eat rocks to help them digest their food. So a gastrolith is a rock that uh, a bird eats to di help digest its food. Uh, and so some, um, some animals that eat gastroliths, they, um, they pass these rocks through their intestinal tract, uh, and as it goes through, it helps to break up the food. But some of them actually just hold these rocks in their bodies all the time, uh, and, and just by holding the rocks in there, it's breaking up the food as the food itself is passing through. Um, and like I said, they're commonly found in birds, but they've also been found uh, in dinosaur fossils. So you just see these piles of, of rock within uh, what would have been the gut of the dinosaurs. So uh, I just want to summarize um, what I've told you in the second half now. Uh, I've told you that there's anatomical evidence from fossils that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Uh, I specifically went over uh, the fact that they reduced their digit number and have the semi-lunate carpal bone, which would have in birds facilitated flight, and also uh, dinosaurs had feathers. And I've also shown you that there's behavioral evidence from the fossil record that dinosaurs were acting like birds. They exhibit brooding behavior, they show parental care, and they eat gastroliths. Um, and I, I, I hope I've shown you that these avian traits evolved slowly over time. It wasn't as if birds just appeared one day as a bird, um, but actually a lot of these traits evolved in dinosaurs prior to what we call birds. Um, and so hopefully I've convinced you that in fact, Dinosaurs are still around you all over the place today. Um, they are lurking in your backyard. They're everywhere. They're, they're birds. Dinosaurs are birds are dinosaurs. Um, and so you really are living in a Jurassic world. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and thank you guys for coming. Mm -hmm. Looking at comparative leg structure, you talked about the, uh, the, hip, the hip socket that humans and other upright mammals have. But it just made me, I mean, a lot of dinosaurs aren't, they didn't, or as far as I know, never been depicted walking around on two legs. I mean, like, so is that structure, like, maybe think of the ankylosaur, which is sort of the one that most sort of has a club tail, looks a bit like a modern alligator or crocodile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, they definitely still have the same pelvic structure. Um, so a lot of dinosaurs. So the, the question, the question was, um, why if um, why, why do some dinosaurs walk on four legs um, if they have this erect uh, th these erect legs with the pelvis with the with the pelvic sockets? Um, and it's it's so first I'll say that the the ancestor of all dinosaurs. Um, 
it, it, it was bipedal. So it, it did walk on two legs. And a lot of the dinosaurs that we think of, like the theropods really, we, we, we do think of as being bipedal, like the T-Rex or the Velociraptor. They have these very small arms. Um, but in fact, even the, even the quadrupedal animals, even the, even the dinosaurs that walked on four legs, they had the same pelvic structure. Um, and so I, I maybe wasn't super clear about this, but um, in... Um, in archosaurs and crocodiles, they, since they don't have those holes in their pelvis, their legs are, are like pointing out at an angle from, from their body. So, um, e e so dinosaurs that walked on four legs, their legs pointed straight down. Um, so if you think of like a, a brontosaurus, it was enormous. Um, and it, it had four legs. It walked on four legs all the time. Maybe occasionally it would rear up on two legs. I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows that. But, um, uh, <laughs> but it definitely was mostly on four legs. It was just that it was on four legs that were standing straight up, which would would allow it to uh, to breathe better and um, and also to um, to give it more. Uh, more freedom of movement and to be able to support more weight. Um, so it's just the difference of being like this instead of like this, basically. Yeah, so the question was, does the brontosaurus exist? Um, and, well, it depends who you ask, but um, the most recent evidence suggests that the brontosaurus does exist. So the apatosaurus and the brontosaurus were um, off and on, sometimes thought of being, as being the same species, but different ages. Um, uh, so depending on how old the individual was, it might have been thought of as one versus the other. But in fact, now scientists think that the brontosaurus is a distinct species from the apatosaurus. But it, some, some, some scientists don't agree. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so the question was, did feathers evolve from scales? Um, so uh, the ancestors of, uh, of dinosaurs, um, so we know dinosaurs had feathers, but the ancestors of dinosaurs had, had scales. And, and probably, or I, I, I don't know, but dinosaurs probably had scales too. Um, but um, scales and feathers are both ectodermal appendages. So what that means, they evolve from our outer, uh, outer, outer tissue layer. So um, organisms develop from three tissue layers. There's the outer layer, the ectoderm, which forms our nerves and our skin. Um, and then the middle layer, the mesoderm, which forms our muscle, uh, our heart, uh, and then our, the inner layer, the endoderm, which forms the internal organs. Um, but this outer layer, the ectoderm, can form all sorts of different appendages. So in, in um, humans, for example, we have sweat glands. Uh, we have ec uh, eccrine sweat glands. They, they release water when we get hot to thermoregulate. So there, and uh, teeth are also considered ectodermal appendages. So there's all sorts of different ectodermal appendages. Um, so uh, feathers didn't necessarily evolve from scales. In fact, they probably didn't. I'm not 100% sure on that. But they both, um, they both developed from ectoderm. From, from the ectoderm, so they have a similar origin. You teased this a little bit. Uh, why couldn't a velociraptor open a door? Ah, <laughs> why couldn't a velociraptor open a door? Well, so they can't. They couldn't grab a door. Um, they, they could only move their hand like this, but a lot further than I could move it. Um, so they, they're just. They wouldn't have any way to grasp it. Um, they, yeah, they just can't hold on to things. Oh, so the semi-luna join means it can't move this way instead of moving this way. Yeah. I thought it meant in addition to No. Yeah, they have, their, their wrists move completely differently than ours. Just a common misconception. Uh, in fact, usually the, the, um, the, largest, uh, the, the largest problem with uh, depictions of dinosaurs is how their hands work. Uh, scientists always complain about that, so Jurassic Park always gets it wrong. No offense. Yeah, this is kind of a type of door the could break it down. Well, <laughs> yes, it could run, it could have run through the door probably. But well, and actually another misconception of the Velociraptor in the Jurassic Park movies, it's actually based entirely off of the Deinonychus that I've been telling you about. So they actually worked with John Ostrom to, uh, to discuss how it worked, completely ignored what he had to say about how the, uh, how the wrist moves, um, and, and then ignored that it was a Deinonychus and decided they liked the name Velociraptor better. Uh, a Velociraptor is very closely related to the Deinonychus, um, but it's actually a lot smaller. So probably a Velociraptor couldn't actually run through a door. But. <laughs> We have a uh, question from the live stream. At what point did flight begin to evolve? And is there evidence that the Arctic could fly or glide? 
Um, so the question was, when did flight evolve? Um, and so, so birds, birds evolved from dinosaurs, like, I, like I've shown you, but um, they, it, it's unclear exactly when the first birds became true birds. So when were they flying? Um, Definitely uh, birds flew, um, and the Archaeopteryx flew, um, but I'm not 100% sure of exactly when flight evolved, um, and I don't know if the fossil record is 100% clear, um, since it is a little bit ambiguous where this transition is between um, these Maniraptora and non-avian dinosaurs and uh, avian dinosaurs or birds, uh, but at some point in that, in that narrow window, uh, they did evolve flight. And, all, all birds would have originally flew, and then later um, birds uh, then uh, did later, some birds did later evolve to become much larger uh, and, and abandon flight. So there's fossils of birds like the great mo, which is uh, some of the most giant birds that ever existed, and you'd be terrified if you saw one of those birds. They're, uh, I don't know how much larger than a human, maybe three times larger than a person. Um, so you wouldn't want to run into a bird like that, but they didn't fly, but those birds actually developed from birds that, that did. Because Archaeopteryx was very small. It flew, yeah. Uh, that Egg Mountain place that you were talking about, uh, what, what event captured all that uh, evidence in, in place? So the question was, what event captured um, in place Egg Mountain? Uh, so Egg Mountain was the place I showed you that there's evidence for parental care of dinosaurs, this Myasaur uh, colony. So all these, all these nests were congregated together. Um, and in fact, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's, uh, it's possible and, and even probable that scientists know what happened there, but I don't, I don't know. Um, but it, it, I suspect it would have been something very sudden um, that would have captured them all there at one time. Maybe a, a very instantaneous nearby volcanic eruption, but as Martin said, they might have been warned about that by, um, uh, by an earthquake, so I'm not 100% sure, but we can, we can figure that out and talk about it after if you're interested. So the question, the question was, um, with the, the, the dinosaurs that were decreasing in size, so the dinosaurs that evolved into birds, the, the theropod lineage that, were, that was decreasing their size, um, whether the fact that they were getting smaller, whether that could have also had to do with, with this pedomorphic evolution that was going on. Um, and it, it, it's unlikely. So um, these, these, this lineage of dinosaurs was getting smaller um, before the... Um, before, for, I, be, I believe before birds were changing the size of their head, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it could be that they're, that they're related, um, given that uh, a lot of the genes that are important for patterning our development uh, work in multiple tissues. So it could be that, it had, that, that whatever mutations that these dinosaurs were um, accruing over time uh, to go through these changes, it could, have, it could have been that some of the changes uh, were important for both shrinking their size and for this pedomorphic evolution of their skulls. Um, but it's not something that we um, know about or I think could necessarily even have any way of knowing about since we don't have, um, uh, we don't have molecular, uh, very much at all molecular evidence for, um, for how this evolution might have worked. Uh, since we can, we can look at the genomes of modern day birds, but it's very difficult to get DNA from, uh, from creatures this old. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this was something I left out of the talk, but um, there was uh, some, there has been some soft tissue recovered, uh, so like collagen fibers, the fibers that give our skin like its stretchiness or, or um, tendons and, um, and ligaments their stretchiness. So some collagen fibers were found uh, and the protein was able to be um, sent through a mass spec to identify what the sequence of the protein actually is. Um, and so in that case, the, the, the um, uh, then we, we know that the, the T-Rex, that this soft tissue was from, this collagen was from, that that collagen is a lot more similar to, um, bird, to modern bird collagen than to modern rep reptilian collagen, which again supports this idea that birds were evolving. But we don't really know the answer to your question of whether the shrinking size and pedomorphic skulls were, uh, were evolving together for the same reason. Did they have the 
seen lifespan when they were large as they did it as they did it to involving birds because birds don't really get that one. So the question is, what was the lifespan uh, of, of these dinosaurs, uh, particularly while these theropod dinosaurs were, were decreasing their size, whether decreasing their size had an effect on their lifespan? Um, and I have to plead complete ignorance to that. I, ha know, I have no knowledge of how long most dinosaurs lived. Um, it, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm just not sure. But I, I don't think size of an <laughs> organism in general is necessarily correlated with how long it lives. I think we have time for one more question. So, uh, it's believed that more than humans are originated from Africa. So, is there a place believed to be the, where the more than birds common ancestor comes from? Um, so the, the question is, is it known where modern birds evolved? Um, so the Archaeopteryx was found in Germany, um, but that doesn't really answer that question. So the fossil record, unfortunately, is really limited, so we only know what we have available. Um, and so that means that that question is really open. Um, it could be that birds evolved just about anywhere. We don't, we don't know. All right, well, thank you very much.